Dr. Slivian Pierre Nzeimana is a nephrologist from Burundi and uh, he'll be uh, covering the topic of retarding or prevention of uh, that disease progression of diabetic kidney disease to end stage renal disease. And he will go through the therapeutic uh, recommendations as well. We also have Dr. Harida Soki, is a consultant physician and nephrologist from Nairobi, Kenya. And she's also the co-chair of the Afri Afran Young Nephrologist Committee. And also he will be taking us through the topic of uh, pre end stage renal you know, disease care, I mean, TEOPS optimization, the key to improve dialysis outcomes. And lastly, will be Professor or Dr. Pasco Rugajo. Uh, he's a consultant physician and nephrologist from Tanzania and the head of Department of Internal Medicine and Nephrology at Muhimbiri University of Health and Allied Sciences in Tanzania. So he'll be uh, leading us uh, in the topic of towards an East African strategy, structure and policy for present, prevention uh, or, and pre end stage renal you know, disease care and RRT in diabetic kidney disease. So the chairman is Professor Kaushik uh, Ramaya. Uh, Professor Kaushik Ramaya is a, a senior consultant physician and diabetologist and the CEO of uh, Hindu Mandal Hospital in Dar es Salaam. And he has got a lot of experience in diabetes uh, in, in, in Africa and the world because he's also, I think, uh, co-chair of the Diabetic Society, uh, World Diabetic Society. So he'll introduce himself clearly on that. So, uh, Professor Kaushik, can you please uh, take on, on the chair? Yeah, Dr. Makwabe, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Huh? Uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation, and it's a privilege to be chairing this session today. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and. Uh, uh, I remember February 20, 2020, uh, uh, February 26, 27th, when we met in Kampala. And I think that is where we started out because during that time we were hosting the East African Diabetes Study Group meeting. And uh, before the meeting, we basically had a concept that most of the people with end-stage renal failure or most of the patients who are on dialysis basically if you find more than 60, 65% of them have got underlying diabetes. And we discussed with uh, Dr. Makwabe and Dr. Lloyd that why don't we have a group of nephrologists within the East African Diabetes Group and trying to see how we can actually get this group moving. And uh, during the last week of February uh, last year, I think they did a wonderful presentation where people really enjoyed the presentation, but at the same time, they understood the gravity of the renal diseases in the East African region. And uh, over a period of time now, starting from one nephrologist, I think we've got multiple nephrologists. I think Kenya was leading with number of nephrologists, and now Tanzania is catching up. Uh, thanks to Dr. Pascal Rugajo, who has been pushing people to join the nephrology wing. At the same time in Uganda also, there has been quite a significant number increase in Rwanda and Burundi to certain extent is coming through. So you find that we have a huge group of nephrologists now, young nephrologists coming in, and these nephrologists are seeing the increasing burden which we have in the East African region, but at the same time, looking at different components of nephrology related to how do we prevent somebody with chronic disease developing renal failure. At the same time, if they have developed a very early nephropathy, how do we prevent the rapid progression which occurs if we do not control the underlying risk factors? And once a patient is on the dialysis, what do we do to make sure that the quality of life is improved? And then nowadays we are also talking of a renal transplant. So I think today you are going to hear from the East African region, all the different spectrum of nephrology which is there and then I'm, I'm sure you will enjoy the presentation. And after the presentation, we'll have question and answers. And answers. We'll have a discussion. So welcome, Dr. Dr. Makwabe, who is the first speaker. He will introduce the topic and then we'll, we'll take notes. If you have any questions, you can always ask. And at the end of the session, we'll have a session 
on question answer and discussions. Karibu Dr. Makwabi. Uh, thank you, Professor Kaushik. And um, as you can see clearly on the screen, um, the topic today is diabetic uh, kidney disease. Uh, this, uh, this has been divided into five parts, but I'll take the first part, which is introduction. So the agenda for presentation today, uh, this is my agenda. And I'll try to, you know, to be strict in less than 10 minutes because we have four presenters now instead of five, because one dropped out. And therefore, you know, to make sure that we finish uh, at least on time before seven o'clock. So we try to be strict on time and Professor Kaushik would like you to, you know, if somebody gets more than 10 minutes, then you, you know, you give him two minutes more so that we finish on time. So this is my agenda. So, uh, you know, diabetic kidney disease uh, is, is a syndrome um, where diabetic kidney disease is, is, is a clinical syndrome characterized by the following. You know, this is persistent proteinuria, which is more than 300 milligrams per 24 hours. And um, this one should be taken at least in, in three, in, in two occasions and um, at least in three to six months apart. So you can't just take it once and then say this is diabetic nephropathy or diabetic in disease. So it should be at least two times in two occasions and uh, in three to six months apart. And um, this can also be diagnosed uh, if the following criteria is fulfilled. Uh, if the patient has a uh, presence of diabetic retinopathy, and uh, epidemiological studies have shown that, you know, uh, although retinopathy appears to be more common than nephropathy, uh, but 90% of patients type, with type 1 diabetes uh, uh, who have diabetes for more than 20 years actually has nephropathy. And also if there's absence of clinical or laboratory evidence of chronic uh, other uh, kidney you know, diseases. So, um, proteinuria is, as you said, is a, is a hallmark of, of, of the disease, and this one was recognized uh, first was recognized in 1930 by the popular scientist called Chemistry and Wilson, and uh, he described the classic regions of nodular glomerular sclerosis in diabetes and was associated with proteinuria. This is when exactly in 1930 that's when it was, you know. Uh, I mean, found. So, and this uh, later uh, then clearly uh, it becomes a, a, a complication of diabetes and with more than 50% of patients with diabetes of more than 20 years having this complication of diabetic nephropathy. So, uh, currently diabetic nephropathy is a leading cause of uh, chronic kidney disease. And uh, in, in, that is in, in US and European countries, but also in Africa. And it's a leading cause of you know, complications in terms of mod uh, morbidity and immortality. So clinically, uh, diabetes, uh, diabetes nephropathy is characterized by progress progressive increase in proteinuria and declining glomerular filtration rate. And hypertension and you know complication of cardiovascular in terms of mobility and mortality. So uh, uh, therefore, if we detect early the proteinuria, then it will prevent the onset of diabetic nephropathy or diabetic kidney disease. And uh, this has been shown in both type one and, and, and type two that if you prevent uh, and you you treat. I mean, if, if, if you detect it early, you treat, and then you can delay and prevent the onset. And therefore, somebody else will be pre talking about prevention and, and treatment of diabetic nephropathy later on. So, diabetic uh, microalbuminuria and, and, and diabetes. It should be clearly known that microalbuminuria is not always predictive diabetic nephropathy as it has been shown in this study that was conducted by Kinsey and uh, published in Diabetic Care in 2013. And in this study, it was, you know, 
uh, normal albuminuria and albuminuric patients with diabetic, type 2 diabetes and impaired renal functions. So it was very clear that in this study that there was significant, uh, there was a significant uh, number of patients who had type 2 diabetes and normal albuminuria. So you can have type, type 2 diabetes, still have normal albuminuria. Though uh, patients who had type 2 diabetes and albuminuria were more likely to develop renal insufficiency compared with those patients who didn't have diabetes. So there was also another study that was conducted in China. It was a retrospective study done by the Fan and Wang, and also indicated that type 2 diabetes patients with the renal injury, there's a high prevalence of non-diabetic renal disease. That is, uh, there was like uh, eight, among eight, eight patients who had type 2 diabetes uh, who developed, uh, who had renal biops uh, at autops, the incidence of non-diabetic renal disease was 72% compared to 20% for diabetic patients, uh, diabetic, who had diabetic nephropathy. So still patients can have, you know, Diabetes, develop diabetic kidney disease, but only 20%, that is in China, who only developed diabetic nephropathy, but 72.7% had non diabetic renal disease. So there, there has been a confusion between diabetic kidney disease and diabetic nephropathy. And diabetic kidney disease, this is a clinical diagnosis, you know, based upon albuminuria and from the glomerular filtration rate. And also uh, diabetic kidney disease in diabetes, but not in, uh, you know, in diabetic nephropathy is used to specify classic glomerular lesion in diabetes. So this is a pathological diagnosis in diabetic nephropathy. That is, you know, you do biopsy and then you find uh, that classical future of diabetic nephropathy, glomerular basement, membrane thickening, mesangial expansion, and all other classical features of diabetic nephropathy. So patients with diabetic kidney disease have the risk of progression to end-stage renal disease. 10% um, with diabetic kidney disease uh, would prevent, would prevent, would progress to uh, end-stage renal disease. And that is, uh, they will go either to dialysis or kidney transplant. And 90% will die of you know, complication, mostly related to cardiovascular disease and, and, and so uh, diabetic kidney disease develops in approximately 40%, as it was uh, clearly pointed out by Professor Kaushik, that 40% of patients with diabetic will progress into chronic kidney disease. And uh, the natural history of diabetic kidney disease includes hyperfiltration, progressive albumin, that will be covered uh, uh, during pathophysiology of the disease. Um, Worldwide, uh, there is uh, 445 million people. This is the data by uh, 2019. And uh, uh, th this one, the data will increase actually by, by uh, 20, uh, 2040, we almost double. And the driving force for this increase in, in, in diabetes, uh, kidney disease and diabetes itself is, is obesity. And um, we have seen that, you know, the study was conducted in, in between 1980 to 2000, the overall prevalence of adult diabetes, I mean, obesity was 15 to 31 percent in the United States. We don't have the exact data in Africa, but this is, is what was found in the United States. So pro, if we, we prevent diabetes, I mean, obesity, then we'll be preventing the risk of So in Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the prevalent of, of diabetic kidney disease, uh, this is the study that I found uh, was conducted in Sub-Saharan Africa and included uh, five uh, countries, including Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, and Nigeria. So it was published in BMC in 2018, and this was a meta-analysis study. And um, uh, this one, uh, they found that the, the pooled uh, point estimates of uh, diabetic nephropathy was 35.3%, uh, while 41.4% were patients with type 2 diabetes. 
and uh, among Africa, I mean, in East Africa, 40% of patients uh, had uh, diabetic nephropathy. So that is uh, the prevalence of uh, diabetes in, 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 in East Africa. So coming up to the risk factor, this uh, will also be covered in the next presenters. And, um, but in, to summarize this slide is that, you know, hypertension and hyperglycemia is the, the, the risk, the most prominent risk factor in the development of diabetic uh, kidney disease. And uh, the risk factors can be classified into susceptibility factors, initiation factors, and progression factors. Again, this will be also covered uh, in, in by the next presenters. So that will be my uh, last slide, but uh, in, in conclusion, uh, that diabetic nephropathy is a common complication in, in patients with diabetes and common cause of end-stage renal disease. And if detected early, you can prevent uh, or re reverse the progression of diabetic nephropathy to end-stage renal disease. So that is my end of presentation, and I would uh, welcome the second presenter, who is uh, Dr. Uh, Sylvian Pierre. My name is uh, Sylvain Pierre Nzeimana. I'm a nephrologist in Bujumbura. Uh, yes, I was uh, trained in nephrology in Belgium at the uh, Catholic University of Louvain Medical School, and uh, uh, I work in Burundi since. Uh, 2016, in the end of 2016. Now I'm a director of medical affairs at uh, Kira Hospital. And I'm also the chairman of the Burundi Medical Council. My topic today is about prevention or prevention of CKD to end-stage renal disease, the East African perspective. Uh, okay. Let me notice that uh, diabetes is a growing Sorry, is a growing epidemic, especially in the middle and low income countries. And uh, it's the most common cause of CKD and end stage renal disease in, in high income countries. Is the increase of prevalence, in prevalence of CKD, ESRD, secondary to diabetes, parallels to worldwide rise, rise in uh, prevalence of diabetes. Because as you can see, in uh, 2000, it was uh, around 7.1 million. But in 2011, it was the double. And uh, the estimated prevalence, according to IDF Atlas, uh, uh, is, is estimating that in 2030, there will be 28 million, million people with, uh, with uh, diabetes in, in Africa, which means those, those, that population will actually, if it is not well um, managed, develop uh, um, kidney conditions like uh, kidney failure. Okay, you all know that diabetes is a leading cause of cardiovascular diseases, kidney failure, blindness, and lower limb amputation, uh, vascular events, cardiac events or cerebral vascular events. And uh, as you can see, the 44% of new kidney failure cases are observed in patients with diabetes which is actually a critical issue for people with uh, diabetes. Then the stages of the, stages of the of, um, of, uh, uh, diabetes nephropathy uh, are, it, it comes slowly, slowly but surely uh, from hyperfiltration to the silent, we have hypertension and the GFR will be too low, lower than 15 ml per minute. And at that time, when you do the, the biopsy, the kidney biopsy, you can see a focal or global glomerular uh, sclerosis. This is actually, that means that the, your kidney is like, is, is dead, there is no kidney anymore. And that's the time to start uh, renal replacement therapies. So the challenges of the nephrologist are the early diagnosis of nephropathy, including identification of, uh, of non-diabetes causes of renal disease is actually uh, a challenge and to manage the various stages of the CKD, early, late dialysis and tra transplantation in individuals with diabetes mellitus. And uh, 
We also have to, to deal with the challenges in cardiovascular diseases and outcomes and the burden of the number and the cost involved. And uh, as you know, the nephrologist uh, is uh, most of the time dealing with those patients, but you, you all know that it is a multidiscipline interaction of many specialists to deal with those patients with uh, uh, many uh, complications. So the progression of CKD to end-stage renal disease, uh, how to slow it? And actually, this is the challenge, how to slow the progression of the chronic kidney disease. And uh, you, know, you know, when it is still starting, there, is no, there, there are actually no symptoms. And um, as, as it is uh, progressing, then we'll see some symptoms. And at this end stage, we'll see all the symptoms of the kidney failure. And uh, you can see here on this table, uh, the, 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 how we can evaluate the, the progression of the chronic kidney disease by the GFR and also by the albuminuria. You can see here it is uh, the albuminuria, stage one, uh, A1, A2, A3, and uh, here you can see the, the stage of the, of the decreasing of the GFR. As you can see here at the stage A1, J, uh, G1, when the GFR is higher or, or around 90, and uh, there is a normal or mildly increased uh, albuminuria, you see there is, uh, there is low risk to develop a chronic kidney disease. But as, the, as the, 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 the albuminuria is increasing and uh, the GFR will definitely uh, decrease and will we'll reach this, the, 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 the end stage renal disease, where you will have a big albuminuria and uh, low GFR. It is the same here. And here it is the plan, the plan how to manage those patients. At the stage one, you, you must do the diagnosis and be sure that the, 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 the kidney uh, impairment is due to diabetes. And then you have to treat the cause. The cause may eventually be the diabetes to slow progressions and the progression and evaluate the risk for heart disease. And here, uh, you know, we have many medicines, the ARBs, the AC inhibitors to help us to, to reduce the proteinuria and also to, to protect the kidneys. Um, at the second, when, 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 when uh, at the second stage, when the GFR is between 60 and 80, 89, you must estimate the progression and at the, at the, 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 the following stage, the stage, the stage three, which is actually the critical stage where you can manage the patient uh, and help him not to, 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 to go to dialysis and uh, stabilize him, you must evaluate and treat complications. It is very, very important. At this stage, it's actually a critical stage where everything can happen. It can, the, 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 the decrease of the, of the GFR will then uh, be a marker to show that the patient is, uh, the, 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 the kidney function is decreasing and you must prepare the patient for dialysis, create a vascular access, excess, et cetera, et cetera. And after, when we, we reach the, the stage five, then we must consider dialysis, the proteinuria dialysis or the hemodialysis. So what are the nephroprotective measures? First of all, you, we must have a strict control of blood pressure. It is actually a big challenge to control the blood pressure, uh, especially uh, with our people, our African patients who are not uh, compliant to treatment. And uh, we must uh, balance diabetes. You know, the, the HbA1c level is a good marker of the of the the of a well balanced diabetes. So we must control the albuminuria and the proteinuria. We have the ARBs and the ACE inhibitors, and also we must have moderate protein intake adapted to the patient, and also the salt intake must be uh, lower as, 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 as possible. Another thing is avoid nephrotoxic drugs. You know, I know here in Burundi, for example, I think it is the same in East Africa. You know, it is easy to get medicines at the pharmacy. You know, someone can get, go to the pharmacy to buy diclofenac or ibuprofen. And those, those, those pills, they are taking it like, uh, like beans. 
they, everyone take, is taking those medicines and they, they don't even, they even don't know that the, those medicines are nephrotoxic drugs and they can take it uh, for arthritis or, okay, as, a, as painkillers, and those can, can, uh, can lead to uh, chronic kidney disease. Okay, we must also prevent episode of acute renal failure, especially by hydration. We must patient if he's, uh, he has a good uh, urine output to prevent uh, the episode of acute uh, renal failure by, uh, by drinking, by hydration. And uh, uh, last but not least, to stop, uh, to stop smoking. We all know that uh, you know uh, tobacco is not good for our heart, for our vessels, uh, especially arteries, and it has uh, it is a big uh, it is a big provider of uh, uh, vascular events, especially cardiovascular events. So prevention is the key, as you have seen, because here in uh, in Africa, especially east Af eastern part of Africa, we don't have we don't have the all the all the capacities to 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 and all the equipment or so everything to, to to manage the patient. Then prevention is the key. So you must check your kidneys. That is what we are we are telling patients every day. If you have diabetes, you must check your you must see your nephrologist or your doctor to have uh, some kidney assessment. If you have hypertension, if you are overweight, if one of your parents or other family members suffers uh, suffer from kidney disease, and uh, if you come from ethnic group with high risk, especially you see the, the black people are at high risk of hypertension, of diabetes, then if you come from an ethnic group with risk, high risk, then you should uh, be uh, uh, followed by, by a doctor for the kidney assessment. Here it is the, an advocacy time for the, for the World Kidney Day of this year. It was living well with the, your kidney disease because as, as, as you all know, uh, the, the target, the aim of the, of the treatment is to provide a quality, a good quality of life. And uh, it is uh, also applicable to, to uh, kidney patients the, the, the patients in, in dialysis, patients in, uh, uh, who, uh, who get uh, kidney transplant, we must, they must live well with their kidney disease. And my, la my last slide is uh, about putting people together as uh, this virus, the HIV, and this bacteria, the TB. When a virus and the bacteria can work so well together, why can't we? It is uh, like uh, what we are doing right now, all, all people, all, all doctors, nephrologists, and uh, people who are involved, like AHN, who are involved in uh, kidney, uh, uh, kidney prevention and treatment, uh, kidney or uh, you know, chronic kidney disease prevention and uh, treatment. We are, we are trying to go together to have to have something strong to help our community and to help our East Africa uh, community. Then I think uh, this slide, it, uh, it is the reflect, the reflect of, of our initiative. And I thank the organizer of this uh, webinar. And uh, I thank you all for uh, having uh, uh, participated in this, uh, in this event, in this session. And I hope that uh, if we if we if we we are together, we can achieve more and more. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Yeah, thank you very much for the nice presentation. I think the next presenter is Dr. Harida. Dr. Harida. So you, you have to to unshare so that you allow Dr. Harida to share the slide. Yeah, I think it is done, isn't it? Okay, yeah, it's done. It's done. Okay. Uh, so good evening, everybody, and you'll forgive me for still being at work, I was saying. And uh, um, I want to just thank the Africa Healthcare Network for giving me this opportunity to be part of this wonderful forum. Uh, I know we are usually listeners, and it's just an honor to be involved. So um, my small part of this presentation today is to talk about 
um, the pre end stage renal disease care optimization, and this as a key to improved dialysis outcomes. Um, so today, what I'm going to talk about is uh, maybe I can move that there just a second, please. So what I can talk about is mobility and mortality in the in end stage renal disease. I'll look at a little bit at that. And then the evidence for pre-end stage renal disease optimization, and then what this actually involves, and then we'll come to some, some conclusions. So um, just looking at the epidemiology a little bit of uh, um, uh, end stage renal disease or even just CKD in this region, and, and this is a really interesting paper, really nice paper published in the Lancet um, in 2017. Um, from the Global Burden of Disease Study Group. And uh, I'm just, I just highlighted um, Eastern Africa there on the left. And uh, this is a population of all of us, of about half a million, uh, half a million people. Uh, and this is low to low middle income region. And the prevalence of CKD in this region is 9,764 people per 100,000 population. And this amounts to actually about one in 10 people. So just looking at the data here, in 2017, you see that there were 697 million cases of all stage CKD that were recorded. And this is about 700 million in the world with a global prevalence of about 9.1%. And the global mortality rate from CKD had increased over the span of about 20 years by 41.5%, showing how CKD has become a more, um, something that is uh, coming up more and more often and is uh, coming up as a source of mobility and mortality. And CKD resulted in 35.8 million disability adjusted life years in 2017. And out of this, it was diabetic nephropathy that accounted for almost a third of this daily. 1.4 million people um, uh, in cardiovascular disease related deaths and 25.3 million cardiovascular disease dialysis were attributable to impaired kidney function. So you can see that kidney function does not work alone but will move on into other systems and is connected to everything else. In Kenya, uh, where I'm from, the prevalence is 9,744. That is equivalent um, to other countries in Africa where the prevalence is one to 10. So here we can see, um, and I can just maybe use this pen, we can see um, the causes of death in end stage renal disease patients. So we've already seen what an impact CKD is having. And we can see the mortality that comes from, from, from having CKD and end stage renal disease. And a large part of it is attributable to, um, the mortality is attributable to arrhythmias and uh, cardiac influences. And you can see another large segment over here is other cardiac. And um, there's somewhere here, you can see a large chunk that, that's about 10% over there, or, or a little bit more that is attributable to infection. Um, others coming in over here, of course, people withdrawing from care, perhaps not because of not understanding or perhaps because their quality of life is so poor. But amazingly, other than the cardiovascular issues over here and arrhythmias, you find that 14% of people were dying simply because of hyperkalemia. And so many of these causes of mortality are simply, um, uh, we can get away from it, we can avoid them. Other than that, we find morbidity in end-stage renal disease. People having poor quality of life. And if you ask them, there are many studies that show that these patients are fatigued, they have peripheral neuropathy, they complain about bone pain, they complain about poor memory. And you come to find that this is all related to anemia in end-stage renal disease, um, CKD, MBD, that is bone and mineral disease, um, malnutrition in our patients, heart failure, dementia, depression, because health, good health, is not just simply um, physiological health, but also mental health and social health, according to the WHO. And so all of these things on the right contribute to these things on the left in giving our patients a very poor quality of life. In diabetes, there's something that came up that is known as the legacy effect, or metabolic memory, that we have all heard about. And this refers to long-term health benefits against future complications that result from intensive blood glucose management in diabetes care compared to standard glucose control. And we, we, this, this, uh, this concept came up from the UKPDS study and UKPDS, the prospective diabetes study, the study that looked at targeting 7% uh, 
um, HbA1c versus 7.9% HbA1c. And the risk, the, the, the difference in outcome that that had um, for the diabetic patients. And actually there was a decreased risk of endpoints by between 12 to 32% in these patients. Something that was similarly found in the DCCT uh, trial, which is a diabetes control and, and complications trial for type one diabetics. And so this led to people also thinking about a legacy, a sort of legacy effect when it came to end-stage renal disease and when it came to our kidney patients, patients who had CKD. That, uh, and this is uh, pioneered in the early work of Obrador and others. When we look at this paper from 1999, where people started looking at suboptimal care in dialysis patients in the US and looking at what is the prevalence of this and what are the factors associated with this. And they actually found that in the people at the, initial, uh, at the initiation of dialysis, these people tended to have a medium uh, serum albumin level of 3.3 grams per deciliter, that their hematocrit was an average of 28%. 60% of patients had a serum albumin below the low and limit of normal, that is a majority. Again, a majority had a hematocrit of less than 28%. They were all anemic at the point at which they started dialysis. And overall, only 23% of the people who were initiated on dialysis received erythropoietin. Thereafter, the same group um, also looked into what effect, what could have been influencing this. And so they looked at prevalence, predictors, and the consequences of late nephrology referral at a tertiary care center. They hypothesized actually that referring early to a nephrologist as compared to referring late to a nephrologist might have some outcomes on the patient. And they wanted to look at what effect early referral that is greater than four months before the onset of dialysis compared to late referral to a nephrologist would have on the patient. And so it was found that patients who were referred late to a nephrologist tended to have more hypoalbuminemia, 56% versus 80%. Patients who were referred late to a nephrologist tended to have lower hematocrit, less than 28%. That is 33% versus 55%. And all of these were significant. That they were referred to start dialysis at a GFR of less than 5 ml per minute, per 1.73 meters squared that they were less likely to have received erythropoietin, 40% versus 17%, that they were less likely to have a less uh, a functioning permanent vascular access for first hemodialysis, a, a staggering 40% versus 4%. And in conclusion, what they found was late referral to a nephrologist was common, and it was associated with poor pre end stage renal disease care, and that pre end stage renal disease educational efforts needed to target not only the nephrologist, but also generalists and the patients themselves. This led on to further studies where people said, okay, it appears that our patients are starting, and, uh, are starting dialysis when they have been poorly controlled and they're crash landing on dialysis. And this seems to be associated with a, a, a late nephrology referral. But does this actually translate to different outcomes with these patients? So you could see here this study from 2004 by Lorenzo and others, showing that pre-dialysis, where they had a, a hypothesis that pre-dialysis nephrologic care and the functioning AVS at entry were associated with better survival in incident hemodialysis patients. This was an observational cohort study where they went back and looked at retrospective data. And their aim was to evaluate the influence of two variables on mortality. And this is hard outcome of mortality. The presentation mode, did the patient start dialysis planned versus unplanned? And the type of access, did the patient start dialysis with a fistula versus a temporary catheter? And they came to an easy conclusion that an unplanned dialysis initiation and temporary catheter were independently associated with greater mortality rates in incident patients. And the combined influence of both variables was associated with greater mobility and mortality than either one variable. That if you had an unplanned dialysis, with a temporary catheter, which is a majority of our patients, I can say in Kenya, um, then you tended to have worse outcomes. And this other paper in 2001, looking at the consequences of late referral of patients with end-stage renal disease by quarantine uh, and others, and this was in, in Europe, and they found that late referrals had a patients who had late, late referrals had uh, a significantly lower serum albumin and calcium that these patients had poor control of their pressures. They used less calcitriol, phosphate binders, and bicarbonate. 
and that all these patients, and that, that is amazing, even in Europe, all of these patients started dialysis, hemodialysis with a temporary vascular access. And the interesting thing about this is that if patients had late referral and started dialysis with a temporary vascular access, amazingly, these patients tended to stay on average in hospital 31 days versus a seven day hospital stay at the initiation of dialysis, mainly because they came in complicated. And so these had implications, not only on the outcomes of patients, but also on the cost of the health, on the healthcare system. And you can see here, in the, this is happening even more recently in Japan, where emergent initiation of dialysis is related to an increase in both mortality and medical costs. Same thing in 2001, is still happening in 2020. That when patients come in as an emergency to be started on dialysis, and this was associated with short-term care by nephrologists, and uh, it was also associated with when patients started on an emergency dialysis in this one center, there was a high amount of patients dying within four months, and it was a risk factor for death within two years. And of course, it resulted in increased medical costs in these countries where it is the government that is paying for this. So imagine for our patients here in Eastern Africa who have to pay for this out of pocket. Looking at this very recent paper, actually in 2019, um, and this is uh, looking at a paper that it was, was published in the US in the Nature Journal on the impact of poverty and race on pre and stage renal disease care amongst dialysis patients in the United States. And it found that these things are still a factor. That poverty, of course, influences um, referral to a nephrologist. And this is something that we see in our own setup, that patients in the lowest area level of median household income were associated with significantly lower likelihood of pre-ESRD nephrology care compared to those in higher quintiles. And this was significant for both African-American patients and Hispanic patients in the US. So what exactly is optimal pre-dialysis care? Optimal pre-dialysis care includes, number one, as we have seen, timely referral to a nephrologist. And what is timely referral to a nephrologist? And I like these um, uh, uh, guidelines, uh, which are NICE guidelines. I've taken them from the NICE guidelines because they put it quite clearly and quite simply. And it's something I think we need to adopt. And it's something that I, need, we, I think we need to talk about more to our generalists to our um, uh, medical officers, as we call them here in Kenya, and clinical officers, which we also have, something similar to physician assistants that we have in Kenya. Because many of these patients are seen out there, and unfortunately, I think most nephrologists can testify that patients are sent to us when they need dialysis. The role of a nephrologist is not to initiate dialysis. The role of a nephrologist is to prevent dialysis. So refer to a nephrologist when? GFR is less than 30 for everybody that you find. Refer to an ecologist when ACR is 70 milligrams per millimole or more, unless this is known to be caused by diabetes. But this also means that people should be checking microalbumin and albumin creatinine in ratios, which is still not done. So anybody who has an ACR that is greater than 70, unless it is known to be caused by diabetes and is already appropriately treated, needs to be referred to an ecologist. If a patient has an ACR of greater than 30 with hematuria, then all of these patients need to be seen by a nephrologist. We find so many of these patients being treated for recurrent urinary tract infection out in the, in the community rather than being referred to us. They are referred to us when kidneys have already failed. When a patient has a sustained decrease in GFR of more than 25 uh, ml uh, per minute per 1.73 meters uh, squared, and a change in GFR category, then it is time to refer to a nephrologist. That means it, don't refer to a nephrologist if uh, GFR has fallen from 100 to 75, but maybe uh, from 75 um, to 50, then definitely refer to a nephrologist. Or if there is a sustained de decrease in GFR of more than 15 in one year, then it's time to refer to a nephrologist. So even if a patient has a GFR of 80 and suddenly it is 65 in one year, it's time for, to think about referring to a nephrologist. If a patient has resistant hypertension, <laughs> as, uh, hello, sorry. If a patient has resistant hypertension, um, can we mute our microphone? Thank you.
So if a, a patient has um, resistant hypertension that remains poorly controlled, despite the use of at least four antihypertensive drugs at therapeutic doses, then this sort of resistant hypertension needs to be referred to a nephrology. If the patient is known or suspected to have rare or genetic causes of CKD, or if the patient is suspected to have renal artery stenosis, then it is time to refer that patient. Other things that we need to consider in optimal pre-dialysis care are adequate review and management of comorbidities. Many times we find patients in CKD4 and CKD5, and suddenly um, the focus shifts to managing um, uh, uh, chronic kidney disease, when really we should remember that there was something at the back of this that caused the chronic renal disease. And you find that people forget to manage sugars, people forget to manage pressures. And when we look at the morbidity and mortality that was surrounding CKD, we saw so much cardiovascular disease, we saw so many comorbidities of that, uh, so many complications of diabetes. We find patients coming to us and not, uh, the, the, the blood sugars have not been managed and they get amputations and they get blind and they get heart failure. And these are things that we still have to remember are ongoing at the back of diabetic nephropathy. Adequate treatment of CKD5 complications. So we have to remember that even as this patient's GFR is going down, there are things that we have to help with. For example, the simple use of sodium bicarbonate can retard the progression of kidney disease and prevent dialysis for a long time, as evidenced in the ideal um, um, uh, kidney trial. Dietary education. So this is something that confuses a lot of patients because, for example, in diabetes patients, diabetes patients have been told only eat brown. And then suddenly they come in in CKD5 and we're trying to avoid dialysis or we're trying to prolong um, uh, uh, the initiation of dialysis. And we are telling them, you know, you shouldn't eat brown things. Or, you know, you shouldn't eat this that is high in potassium. They've been eating a lot of beans. Now we're telling them don't eat a lot of beans. So all of this dietary education needs to be ongoing. Dialysis education. And dialysis education is not just talking about dialysis and hemodialysis. Dialysis education is talking about, do you want dialysis? What does dialysis mean for you? How is dialysis going to change your life? What form of dialysis do you want? Talk about peritoneal dialysis if available, hemodialysis if available, home hemodialysis if available. And in that point, also discuss with your patients their fears and when they would want to start dialysis. So you see, nephrologists can't do that all the time. And nephrologists will tell you that a nephrology and CKD is a multidisciplinary effort. You can't manage it on your own. You need a nutritionist, you need a counselor, you need a physiotherapist, you need to uh, talk to a diabetologist. So many people need to be involved. The placement of a permanent vascular access, and this should be a priority, that when somebody we can see is heading towards end-stage renal disease, then it's, it's a good time to start talking about what does dialysis mean? Let's make a fistula. And the fistula remains ready in case we need to di start dialysis and we don't start dialysis as an emergency. And the last thing is, of course, referral for a preemptive kidney transplantation, because we know it is best that a patient never has to experience dialysis. And lastly, in this slide, talking about the effect of a national pre end stage renal disease care program in Taiwan on expenditures and mortality in incident dialysis patients. And this is a population-based study that looked at 26,588 people in Taiwan. And it's amazing that a program like this could happen. And they talked about a nationwide pre and regional disease pay for performance. They were calling it a P4P in Taiwan, which examined, and this study was looking into pre-hemodialysis care, expenditure, and mortality. And they found that for these people who had enrolled into this program, they tended to have a higher GFR measurement and CK, they actually had to, tended to have less CKD complications on a survey when looked into it. They had a higher rate of vascular access preparation. They had a more frequent use of AV, uh, AVS at the initiation of dialysis. And this resulted in a 68.4% reduction on four-year health total health care expenditure, which was equivalent to US dollars 345.7 million. That's a lot of money. And more importantly, there was a significant 22% reduction in three-year mortality just because patients were well prepared for their dialysis. So that's the end of my presentation. And I want to thank you for listening. And I look forward to um, uh, many questions in the discussion hereafter. <clears throat>
Thank you, Halida. May I hand over? Yes, Halida, thank you very much. Uh, the presentation will prolong until uh, Dr. Pasco finishes. So please bear with us and uh, continue to listen to him until he finishes and the question session finishes. Thank you. Do, do you see my slides? Yes, yes. Yes, yes. we can see no. that there is interference. So, yes, we so can see. Can I proceed? Yes. And see the faces of uh, East African colleagues. And uh, thanks to AHN, thanks to Makwabe for this opportunity. So I think uh, the previous presenters have set a very good scientific uh, work. Mine is less scientific, more of learning uh, support towards East African research agenda, DKD research agenda, which will be based a little bit on the presentations done, but more charting the way forward. Um, I hope we are okay and I'm proceeding now. Yes, please, that's good. Okay, sure. I'll put that. So the East African region, uh, as you can see, is a um, total of almost 200 million uh, population. And if you look at these charts here, um, I compare Tanzania and America. If I cut what I was saying, uh, we have the a population which is very young compared for example, is American population. So we need uh, to put strategies uh, to optimize care, but also to realize that uh, our young populations need to be protected because it's not only diabetes, but many other conditions. If you look at this slide, it shows you that um, the NCDs in East Africa across the board, Burundi, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and Uganda, um, now NCDs uh, contribute to almost uh, between one third to almost one half of mortality. And this is by the year 2020. It is expected that by the year 2030, uh, the proportion of NCD attributing to death will be overlapping that of uh, communicable diseases. So we have a big problem in the coming decade and we really have to uh, ponder now on best ways on how to counteract that. So I came across this study here, uh, which is epidemiology of chronic kidney disease in rural Africa. And uh, this was done in Uganda and Kenya by Antonio Miro et al. Uh, this was the rural population. And the CKD prevalence was 6.8%. And they say here that, uh, however, two thirds of individuals with CKD did not have HIV, diabetes, hypertension, and risk factors. So much as we pay particular attention to diabetes today, uh, there is still a work to do to realize some of the inherent risk factors operating in the East African region. But nonetheless, uh, of this population study, it shows that 8.1 had leukocyturia, 4.6 had hematuria, and 3% had proteinuria. So the background community with uh, already um, visible or palpable risk factors for kidney disease and progressive kidney disease uh, is uh, significant. So we have a lot of work to do. So as we know, and as it has been told, uh, diabetic kidney disease uh, progresses across the board, right? Uh, ranging from diabetogenic factors like being obese, lack of physical activity, to impaired glucose tolerance as a pre-diabetic condition, onset of the full, okay, full, okay, uh, overt diabetes mellitus, the early complications and end stage diabetes complications. So if you look across the board, it's a gradual process which may take years, but uh, which opens opportunities for interventions. So the interventions can be categorized as primordial prevention, which is um, targeted to the population, and then primary prevention, uh, then secondary prevention and tertiary prevention. Uh, so generally, we by far need to increase uh, community awareness on uh, awareness of programs, exercise, diet, uh, uh, at least in measuring your blood glucose, uh, occasionally, especially if you're uh, coming from family history of diabetes and you need to check even more frequently. But then when they move from primordial to primary prevention, then we need to treat to target. So glycated hemoglobin is less than 6.5 uh, and blood pressure uh, less than 130 over 80 or even more stringent if they have proteinuria. But then we know that diabetes does not affect only the kidney. It is a multi-organ uh, con condition. 
So we also need to think about comprehensive care with multi specialty involvement. So these patients should early, even if you they present with a, a, a nephrological condition, where, for example, proteinuria, they should also be sent to ophthalmologist, cardiologist, neurologist for uh, early detection of uh, complications and um, offering comprehensive care. But once it is a full-blown disease, then you want to optimize the care by treating the targets, you reduce complications, you improve quality of life, improve, improve functional status, and also offer social support. It's involvement of the community, because that's where we want to catch it early, because by far, we spend a lot of our time in the hospitals, but actually that is very little and probably very late uh, of, uh, in the prevention cycle. So we should be now focusing more on community awareness and community prevention. And this needs to reassess the situation, to set individualized goals. Not every uh, precaution uh, fits all. So we need to know uh, the community and offer uh, tailored uh, interventions. But we also need to plan and we need to follow up and maintain what is working. But this includes uh, actually knowing your individual population. As uh, Karida put it very nicely, so the free ESLD management uh, is in natural history, takes around six to seven years uh, from when the uh, CKD stage one sets up to end stage renal disease. So not all patients should be placed in one basket as CKD. Uh, they go through these stages and these stages kind of open windows for us to intervene. So as we know, stage one and two, there'll be so much focus on treating to targets uh, of the comorbidities. Stage three, there'll be a lot of uh, preparation, counseling, prepare for donation, uh, uh, prepare for options for renal replacement therapy. And stage four will be like more uh, issues uh, pertaining to preparation, like uh, giving vaccines, like uh, uh, in, uh, creating uh, arterial venous fistula for patients who are motivated. So you see this uh, progression uh, gives us time to intervene uh, so that by the time patients reach stage five, first they are educated, they are motivated, they are given choices and they are part of the treatment. Uh, we also know that um, there are patients who will be hovering between uh, comprehensive care, dialysis, and transplantation, because this can be uh, done in cycles. But we also need to give our patients options, because the mainstream care is like uh, is hemodialysis. Uh, we rarely talk to patients about other options, and um, we should know that, uh, that there are some conditions, uh, there are some conditions which are better treated by dialysis, and some conditions which are better treated uh, by uh, the conservative management. So if you look at this uh, right-hand side uh, chart here, you can see symptoms like fatigue and not taken care by both. More solid levels, more dialysis, protein and calorie intake, more non-dialysis, anemia, more dialysis, depression and anxiety, conservative care. So there is this uh, ping pong between which fits more. And uh, probably when we learn that it, dialysis does not offer all solutions, and when it is cleverly combined with conservative care, it is what is, it offers maximum uh, outcome, especially for patients who have not reached that stage. Okay? So the supportive care, as Harida put it, uh, gears at symptomatic management, making sure that the patients has physical, psychological, and spiritual balance. You, but you also need expert communication in terms of shared decision making. Don't make the patient only on the receiving end. Patients should also be uh, part of the decision. But we also need interdisciplinary team support. Sometimes we tend to forget the role of a nurse, palliative care, dietitian, social workers. Um, but at times uh, we also need to know whether we want to continue with uh, conservative care without dialysis. Uh, or max, with maximizing quality and quantity of life for patients who you are almost sure that they'll not benefit much from dialysis. And in rare cases, especially in the Western countries, but I'm also sure it is coming here, it is also about end of life care. So it will come with time as we are getting old populations, whether you think patients should be committed to dialysis or they should be 
just handled to relatives with good care and good counseling on how to take care of them at home. Of course, we know the conventional uh, renal replacement modalities, and we should know that, um, uh, as it was said, that for diabetes, patients progresses probably to this more rapidly than other underlying conditions, but patients should be given options. And we should also remember, for special situations, continuous renal replacement therapies with all these modalities are also some options. So with even this background knowledge, uh, what should we be doing in the East African uh, DKD research strategy? Uh, we are aiming to influence the policy at the end, but uh, frankly speaking, policy cannot be uh, just influenced by standard medical practice, uh, which is adopted from uh, uh, other regional uh, guidelines without uh, finding evidence which is local and trying to influence policy by evidence which is local. So I was looking at this chart. If we really want to influence policy and policy influence our practice, we should remember um, different evidences of research. So we have like T0 uh, phase one clinical trials. Probably these are not very common here and because they're expensive to carry out. But then we have like T1 evidence, observational studies, uh, these are the ones which we should be aiming at, uh, and then this will be uh, going to increase the levels of evidence uh, for, from discovery to application to evidence-based recommendations, which will yield uh, guidelines, and then um, we'll go to implementations, which will influence practice and control programs, and then this will be fed to population health. So together, these will influence policy and we should be aiming at uh, achieving models like this if we want really to impact on our local population. If you look at this small diagram here, probably small, but uh, it just involves the community right in the middle of center, but it reminds us uh, CKD or DKD uh, will only be cared if uh, it is a multi-sectoral involvement involving caretakers, universities and researchers, policymakers, uh, and others. So uh, this slide, uh, the, the last two slides probably, uh, they kind of reflect my proposals rather than hard fact uh, knowledge. Um, so if I take them a little bit slower because I still, I still have a, a bit of time. So we are saying uh, we are mostly in the hospitals but this presentation just reminds us the hospitals or patients who afford to come to higher centers where they give dialysis are just the tip of the iceberg. So we should have a wide scope of looking where these patients coming from. And uh, actually, if it was feasible and possible, we would like to, to screen the entire population for risk factors for kidney disease. But probably this is not valid for money probably the frequency of this can be just done to subsections of the populations during wet kidney day and other thematic uh, uh, kidney uh, investigations. But rather, we should be looking at, uh, at risk groups. For example, screening the risk, uh, those who are probably old, uh, those with family history, those who are obese, they should be screened more uh, uh, frequently and given advice. But, uh, where do nephrologists get patients? By and large, they get them from general medical clinics, ranging from all lower cadres, from health centers, the dispensary, district hospitals, regional hospitals, and above. So we need to create very good collaborative links and um, engage uh, clinicians at these lower levels in our research consortiums so that they are also part of uh, this bigger picture. But when patients come uh, from these general medical clinics, usually they are channeled or referred to specialized care clinics. And as we said, uh, nephrology is, uh, and especially diabetes actually is a multi-systemic disease. So patients may not come directly to nephrology clinic. Some will go through nephro clinic, some will go from cardio clinic, some neuro clinic, so some ophthalmology clinics and others. So we need um, a network uh, similar tools, standardized tools, which will be able to pick these patients and probably uh, facilitate observations and research among these different subspecialties. But today, because we are speaking of uh, nephrology, 
I wish that uh, we have very strong collaborations with these other specialized clinics so that once they pick patients with DKD or suspected DKD, they are also referred early to us. And once we pick patients with DKD, we should also remember that these patients may have other systemic conditions and send to these respective clinics. So, uh, but uh, again, Kaida put it very nicely on the optimal pre-RRT and RRT care. Uh, in general, we need to engage our patients and give them options and make sure that they are informed, their families are informed, and they are into the sharing decisions models. But we should also know that these patients belong to the community. Sometimes, uh, patient, I mean, doctors in the lower levels, they refer patients to us. But then uh, when we get, take care of these patients, we send back patients to the community without any referral notes or any medical reports to the doctors. If we are aiming at good care, it should be by directional referrals. So once we take care of these patients, we should send very good notes to the primary physicians and we should be in touch with these patients and these physicians as much as possible. So the way I look at it is we need again to, call, to focus on the community. We have to design studies, uh, DKD demographic surveys. If we are influential enough, probably even in the census, we can insert parameters there which can help us pick um, early features of kidney disease. But from this, we also need to go a little bit further and start doing observational studies. Uh, some of these will be cross-sectional descriptive studies. Some of these will be case control studies. And this will give us the magnitude and the risk factors. But uh, for better, deeper observations and deeper analysis, we need to develop cohorts, uh, some retrospective, some prospective. But we also need uh, mid-term and long-term follow-up by doing longitudinal studies where we can follow these cohorts at different time points and see if they're developing um, complications, including the kidney disease, and intervene to decelerate and delay the progression as much as possible. But as, as we consolidate and become a little bit stronger with uh, cohorts and longitudinal studies, we should think of doing RCTs and meta-analysis, and this can be uh, of use if it is coming from a bigger region. You know, Days are gone when you want to just publish a paper based on the data from a single hospital, sometimes even a single country. But if we are a bigger region, then we are forced to reckon with. The East African region, as I said, is a home of up to 200 million people. So data which will represent that can even inform the WHO on how to allocate the resources. But at the end of everything, when we have high level uh, evidence research, we will be able now to influence the policy makers by offering policy briefs and cabinet papers, which once they are debated in the parliament, they can end up being uh, strong policy regulations and laws, which will help to protect our citizens. So where do we re re generate research ideas? It is from our day-to-day -day clinical observations, uh, some as academic requirements, and this is where uh, we can make good use of students, uh, both undergraduates and postgraduates, because for them, uh, it is mandatory that they produce uh, research work at the end as a requirement for their graduation. So we have to mentor them, we have to supervise them, and we have to engage them in the research so that um, we come out uh, with uh, strong research at the end. But we do also need to have a lot of ethical considerations because we have institutional review boards, but we also have national review boards, for example, namely in Tanzania and Cameroon in Kenya. So probably before we think about uh, having a bigger kind of uh, research, uh, we need to make sure that we align with uh, these bodies' policies and uh, we get the approvals as such. And then, uh, to sustain it, we need succession plans and we need mentor mentee pairings. Gone are days when you want to be the only guru when you do research around yourself. Uh, but if you, you have mentor mentee uh, pairings, then uh, that is a sure way of sustaining research beyond individual timelines. Then, if we are strong enough, um, then we will be able to apply for funding and grants and develop sustainable fellowships and engage with consortiums beyond our region 
so that uh, we can um, have even more impactful data. So I was thinking, uh, and having trained in the Scandinavia, I think um, the way to go is by developing uh, registries, registries at every level, registries at community screening, if it is possible, registries at uh, diagnosing, at therapeutics, in dialysis, if it is about um, transplantation. So we need registries across. Registries will be a bigger and a good source of making sure that we have data which is uh, standard, uh, but it's also sustainable. Uh, but we also know that uh, starting registries needs commitments, need structured tools, but also need some fundings to sustain them. So all these are discussable, but I think we'll have a lot of impact if we reach uh, that stage, having national registries uh, which are robust, uh, which are also blessed by the, the body, but also the ability to combine the registry. Now, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Rwanda, Burundi. So with that, to just say RIP to JPM, uh, who is our president who has uh, gone ahead of us. He was a fond believer of the East African region. And today, I just saw this emblem with a handshake. So we need to join hands to make sure that uh, research in the East African region uh, is the way to go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, Dr. Ogajo, that was excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I turn back to the chair, uh, Professor Kaushik, are you there? Yes, I'm around. Yes. Yeah, I've been learning a bit of nephrology here. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so thank you very much. I had to take in a marathon because I was hoping. Uh, what are your suggestions on bringing forward a research agenda, Dr. Kaushik, uh, joining forces uh, in the region? And Dr. Rugaj as well, uh, and anybody else? I think that's a, that's a very valid question. And uh, I would first of all ask Dr. Rugajo, uh, since he's with Mohas and he has been really been uh, in the forefront of having a research agenda, uh, let him answer and then I'll also answer from the East African Diabetes Study Group perspective. Dr. Rugajo, please, the floor is yours. I think um, maybe Professor Kalshik, you can proceed while we're yeah, waiting for I'll, him to come in. I'll, I'll just proceed. I think, uh, I think while uh, Dr. Rugajo is getting his uh, bearings right, uh, from East African Diabetes Study Group perspective, what we thought was that it was very important for the East African nephrologists to form a sort of a study group. And within that component of the study group, there is a, there is a, there is a need for a prioritization of the research agenda based on what can be done in the region, whether it should be at a level of prevention, it could be level of operational research, whereby you want to improve the quality of services you are providing, or you're looking at an advanced research whereby you would like to see the underlying pathophysiology which is taking place in the increasing burden of the chronic renal diseases. So I feel that you need to start small, you need to start with something which is practical and which can be possible with the minimum resources because unless you show a track record, getting funding is going to be a major, major sort of obstacle or major challenge. So my suggestion to the group, for the nephrologist group in the East African region, would be to start slowly, small, uh, start with something which is practical and which is basically has got a huge impact. And then you might see that with that track record which you have in place, you'll be able to start going into the next step and doing further investigations, further research and looking at how overall you can improve the quality of care for people who have got chronic renal diseases and how do you try to actually make the community aware and people with chronic diseases like hypertension, diabetes, which seems to be the major sort of uh, uh, major risk factor for chronic renal diseases. How do you make sure that they control the hypertension, control the diabetes and other risk factors well, so that they don't end up into a chronic renal pain? Dr. Makwabe, would you like to take up on behalf of Dr. Lugajo since we can't hear him? Yeah, so uh, he, he projected, Dr. Gadu projected a very good uh, flow chart on how we should go about it. And 
which uh, I agree with him uh, 100%, uh, that uh, we need to have uh, this kind of um, collaborations, you know, starting with ideas, uh, uh, and then from, um, uh, you know, a, a group uh, like we have started, uh, Professor Kaushik, uh, the East African Diabetic Study Group, uh, and in, in this particular case, we can work together with uh, nephrologists, MDs, physicians, and their, their diabetologists to, to make sure that we come up with different topics and ideas, and then we start small. And as we say, uh, East Africa has got uh, more than 200 people, 200 million people. So if we can collaborate in, within East Africa, at least to start with, we start small. Uh, like we can have uh, two or one institution in, in Tanzania, uh, we collaborate with a two or one institution in Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi, and then we can come up with something that is is good. And then once we have something that has been uh, you know done, then we can ask for big uh, uh, funding <clears throat> so that we can have more robust and uh, more organized uh, research. Uh, that will involve the, the whole East Africa. So uh, I agree with you, Professor Kaushik, and uh, Dr. Rugajo for your proposal. Just coincidentally, Dr. Makwabe, the diabetes, uh, diabetes work in all the countries, whether it's Tanzania, it's uh, Zanzibar, it's uh, Uganda, in Kenya, in Rwanda, and Burundi, there's quite a significant progress within the diabetes setups and diabetes programs. And there is, there is a certain stream of funding in all these, these countries. And I feel that, as you mentioned, that if the groups within these individual countries can work with people who are working in diabetes and try to see what component of funding is available and within that component, building some level of operational research, I think that would be your starting stage, whereby you do not need much of the resources, but what you need is a network and to work together. Uh, I agree with you, Professor. You are hundred percent right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, talking from Rwanda. I teach nephrology nursing, and um, this is an uh, you know interesting presentation. Thank you for the presenters. I would like to just to request the team members that um, we need to bring the you know nurses and the nurse academicians on the on board when you are doing the interprofessional and collaborative research. Because in Rwanda, most of the NCD clinics are run by nurses. Those who are trained in that specialty and they do the screening at the initial stage. So I think it's better to involve the nurses and you know somebody from faculty side also so that it becomes an um, interdisciplinary uh, you know, research and it strengthens the information and we bring more collaboration on board. Thank you so much. I think you are absolutely right because when you're talking of, and I think in one of the presentation, there was a very clear indication that this is a multi-faceted approach whereby you need a dietitian, nutritionist, you need the nurses, you need the counselors and you need the clinicians and you need those technicians. So I think it's a multidisciplinary team. And if you're going to do something I think the entire team should be involved because at every stage, somebody or someone is contributing towards the overall better care for the person with these chronic renal diseases. It's probably someone losing uh, his Anybody else? His yeah, link. it's actually somebody else in the, anybody. Hello, that, that, that is my hand, my hand, which was raised. This is yes, Francis. Francis, Korea. please, Dr. Francis, yes. Yes, I'm, I'm really sorry I missed the entire presentation. I'm just joining in during this commenting and discussions. And uh, I mean, my, 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 my take on whatever efforts and collaborative efforts that we're trying to do, I completely agree with what Professor Ramaya has alluded to, that we need to start small. And when you talk about starting small, it's not about doing research. It could be just writing just writing a, a review article, writing an article that is showing you what is existing in East Africa as far as diabetic kidney disease is there. Just writing the ideas that you want to put down. And that is one way of putting the minds together and showing what is existing and what areas 
we can uh, work and um, harness um, the and, 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 and er potential directions that we might take. And definitely there's, there's been a lot of work that is already being done in uh, as far as diabetic care is involved. I believe that uh, diabetic, di endocrinologists and diabetologists have done a lot of good work in this region. And definitely tapping from what they've done already will be um, useful to chart the way forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Francis, for that. Any other comments? For the next discussion, if we can incorporate uh, end stage renal disease with uh, chronic pancreatitis so that we can know if diabetic patient has a chronic pancreatitis and has the end stage renal disease, how do we go about it, especially in terms of regulating his sugars? If next uh, next uh, discussion we can have that as a, as a team, it can help me on the side of nutrition. Thank you. So, Dr. Lloyd, a point to note for you: uh, yes. something on chronic pancreatitis and the management of diabetes to prevent uh, further deterioration of the renal profiles. Yes, uh, yes. Actually, uh, Sylvia is from Kenya. Uh, actually, runs a nutrition program in Chogori Hospital. And uh, I think uh, the, the point is well taken that nutrition should be, should be a very, very important part of this research program. And uh, that is something we are certainly going to take very seriously. And uh, across the board, we would form a nutrition group where we have senior people like Sylvia, and then we have Marianne on the other side, and we have people from here in Tanzania, at least two, three people there. So a group that can be formed and uh, also you know, uh, make them part of this as well, because nutrition is a very, very important component of uh, security management. See, Dr. Dr. Lloyd, I think what Dr. Francis mentioned is that I think the best thing is initially, even if you write a review article on the research needs or what are the research gaps in nephrology in the East African region, that would be your beginning. And I think from the presentation with uh, Dr. Rogaju has done, I think it is just a question of obtaining further information from the remaining countries of the East Africa, and then having one publication which is showing the research needs for the East African region. And uh, that could be your beginning. And then after that, you might be looking at the, the quality of care which is being provided, some sort of a some sort of audit tools to look at the different services which are being provided, comparing the notes and trying to see how you can work amongst yourselves to see to improve the quality there. Uh, yes, actually, I, I should thank Dr. Francis. Uh, it's a very good suggestion. Now, after the first Ugandan meeting, uh, we did actually form a big structure. I mean, and each person is divided out actually as to what each person is going to write as well. So uh, the thing is, uh, COVID came in between and we were completely uh, diverted from that whole uh, uh, area. Uh, we have a full structure in place now and actually allocated to people uh, who are, who actually were on this talk as well as Dr. Givere, who is not there today and uh, plus people associated with them to put out the whole topic. So I think Dr. Francis' suggestion was what we were actually planning to do. And I think, thank you, Dr. Francis, for bringing it up. And I'm sure we're going to do that. And, uh, uh, and Dr. Kali, so it was that Dr. Kalida would uh, do uh, the Kenyan side. Uh, and of course, each country, each of the representatives will do. And, and basically more on what they actually spoke but contribute from their point of view in terms of the whole topic as well. But we have structured the whole thing that way. And I think we could take it forward in, in, the, coming, uh, in the coming couple of months. I think we should have something in place. Very true. Dr. Kalida, any, any comments? Yeah, just thinking about it, I remember you're absolutely right, Dr. Lloyd. <laughs> we had such plans and then now COVID has just taken over. But it doesn't seem like COVID is going anywhere anytime soon. So um, we are, I think we need to proceed. There's been a lot of interest um, on our part and uh, we had a meeting over the weekend um, um, uh, talking about how we would partner and what we would do as steps forward. So on the Kenyan side, we have the Kenya Diabetes Study Group, which is very well positioned 
um, well-funded, has good networks. And of course, we have the Kenya Renal Association, which is always looking to partner. And once again, also very motivated. So um, we also talked about um, in including the Kenya uh, Association of Physicians. And uh, between these partners, and then as you talked about, um, registering this with Camry and the research board, just to make sure that it has legitimacy at the end of the day. It's very exciting to get started. Um, I'd actually started looking at um, the publications that we did have in Kenya, and some of them were showcased today. And uh, um, a lot of data already on the ground. So the idea of having um, a review article is, is really keen, as we had talked about last year, and it's a good place to start. So thank you, Dr. Francis, for that suggestion. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Lloyd. No, nothing to add, huh? nothing to add. I just want to emphasize what you were, you were talking about because I, I, I do think that uh, as Dr. Halida was saying, uh, COVID is, in, is, is not going anywhere. So we must move forward to, to try to, 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 to develop uh, what we have been talking about, uh, the key, uh, the, uh, you know, the, to, to try to build uh, like uh, a network of uh, kidney specialists and also diabetes, diabetes specialists in the East Africa uh, to address the problem, but also to get data, to get data. And uh, as uh, you, 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 you was uh, proposing us to try to, 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 to release a paper, a paper on the, on the uh, you know, on the problematic of the, uh, of the, kidney disease, and also diabetes in the East African uh, region. Then I have nothing to add. I just want to, 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 to tell you that I have the, the same, uh, same view. Why not? Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, yeah I think, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, HN and Dr. Lloyd for organizing this meeting. Second thing, I think uh, I would like to really appreciate the speakers. I think you've done a wonderful job. And it has given a complete, I would say, 360 degrees of the situation of renal disease in East African region. And third, at least there is some sort of a, a light at the end of the tunnel, whereby you find that there is something which we need to do as a group from East Africa. And it is a question of linking with the partnership, seeing which train is moving and just jumping on board of the train and trying to move together. And I think that is very key. And most important thing, I think, is the research agenda is very key. Uh, so I, I hope that within next two to three months, because the decision which was taken by this group in the East African Diabetes Study Group in February in 2020 was that they would have a paper draft ready within six months. And I think now it's one year and uh, uh, it's, it's uh, one year and probably uh, one month uh, so it's around 13 months. So we hope that we should, within the next two to three months, have at least a rough draft to start with, and that will stay, uh, set the stage for moving forward. With this one, I would like to once again thank everyone for participating for an active discussion. And above all, thank you to all the presenters for making all the effort of presenting wonderful presentations. And thank you very much, and have an excellent evening and a good weekend. Thank you very much.